made her suffer for years. Some have suggested she's doing it for fame, possibly for getting in a movie contract or some future benefit. That's despicable. She is doing it because she is a victim who knows she needs to come forward and let the American people know the type of person who is being nominated for the Supreme Court of the United States. Meanwhile, we're here. And what's the purpose of this hearing? It's the last week before midterms and the last opportunity Republicans have to waste precious subcommittee time, which is limited, in which we've spent no time looking into the problems that we've seen about the last election and the fault of the lack of the attacks on elections and voting rights and the emoluments clause violations, et cetera. It is a longstanding tactic of Republican political strategy to relentlessly push the narrative that conservatives are the victims of an oppressive cultural elite that tries to suppress conservative views, almost making a fetish out of their own supposed victimhood. And in the state, statement of the chairman, he said something about stopping people from speaking who have family values. Well, there are a lot of people who have family values who are not conservative. That is not something conservatives have to themselves. Mr. Greengrass back here has his son, Ben. I guarantee you, David Greengrass has family values. This argument is belied by the fact that Republicans currently control all of the elected components of our national government, as well as a majority of state governments. That is hardly evidence that conservative views do not get a fair opportunity to shape public opinion. Indeed, conservatives enjoy the support of a vast and thriving right-wing media machine, ranging from talk radio to where the only thing you can get on AM these days is, is talk radio of the right conservative ilk or sports talk, to Fox News, to a host of conservative websites and social media outlets like Breitbart, Daily Caller, I don't know what their names are, I don't read them or listen to them, but I see their tweets oftentimes making awful pejorative statements, some of which have questioned my religion or some of their followers have and said, yes, we're not surprised his name is Cohen. One of our witnesses later is going to be Cohen. She doesn't think anything like I think. But a lot of those people say, we're not surprised his name is Cohen, suggesting I have some kind of dual alliance with Israel, which, of course, I don't, or other nefarious thoughts. And notable conservatives have held and continue to hold prestigious positions in academia. Just one pro prominent example is Judge Anton Scalia, who prior to being appointed to the federal bench was a law professor at the University of Chicago. Stanford University is home to the Hoover Institution, a respected conservative think tank that has served as a place of scholarship for some prominent Republicans as Condoleezza Rice, Donald Rumsfeld, and George Shultz, as well as conservative scholars like Thomas Sowell and Neil Ferguson. Sowell. And was clearly established during, as was clearly established during two prior full committee hearings on social media content moderation practices, there is no credible evidence that social media companies intentionally target conservative content for censorship. Indeed, similar complaints have been raised by certain liberal activists about the way social media companies applied their content moderation policies. Moreover, even if social media companies were actually intentionally discriminated against conservative viewpoints, it would be so well within their rights to do so, just as Fox News and Breitbart and Sinclair do. In short, there's no merit to the majority's principal argument underlying the hearing. What we should be dealing with are the fact that we're living in a time when the rule of law is under grave threat by the actions of Trump, who appears to have little respect for constitutional and democratic norms, whether the issue is the separation of powers, respect for the judiciary, respect for women, and a free press or a government free of conflicts of interest and ethical lapses. We're living in a time when the right to vote is being undermined by voter suppression tactics ranging from voter identification laws to the elimination of same-day registration and prohibitions on nonviolent ex-offender ex voting, tactics that disproportionately affect African Americans and other minority groups. We're living in a time when the truth itself is, is under attack. We're living in a time when hostile foreign powers like Russia are continuing their efforts to meddle in our electoral system to discredit and erode confidence in democracy itself. We're living also in the time of the Me Too movement where women who have been victims of sexual harassment and sexual assault are bravely stepping forward as Dr. Christine Ford is doing now and, and confronting their victimizers. There are just a few of the many other issues that are far more worthy of the subcommittee's time than today's political gimmick of a hearing. The American people deserve better. 
The gentleman, as time has expired, and the chair would now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Nadler of New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The purported subject of today's hearing is the state of intellectual freedom in America. Despite this lofty title, however, the hearing's actual purpose is to reinforce the bogus narrative that cultural institutions and those who run them are arrayed against conservative people and ideas. We start with an old favorite of the right-wing media sphere, which is the assertion that colleges and universities are dedicated to persecuting conservative scholars while brainwashing students into becoming liberal activists. Simply put, however, there are plenty of conservative academics teaching at colleges and universities, including at least three sitting before us today. And as if a hearing on the topic of liberal academics alone was not already a waste of taxpayers' dollars, today's hearing will also feature a panel on a right-wing conspiracy theory of more recent vintage, namely that social media companies are intentionally suppressing conservative viewpoints. This would now be the third hearing that the House Judiciary Committee has held this year on so-called anti-conservative media bias, anti-conservative social media bias. At no point in the previous two hearings have we been presented with any credible evidence that social media companies are censoring conservatives for ideological reasons. But even if they were, so what? They are private companies. They are entitled, if they want, to propagate or favor whatever views they, they, they favor, liberal, conservative, or whatever. As do Fox, right-wing talk radio, and Sinclair, they're unabashedly right-wing. They have a right to be. Or are the people who are running this committee and the people on the right-wing who are propagating this nonsense, do they favor bringing back the fairness doctrine abolished by Ray Ronald Reagan's FCC? If they do, uh, maybe we can talk about that. And then Fox will be forced to broadcast liberal viewpoints for every conservative viewpoint they broadcast, so will Sinclair, so will right-wing talk radio. Right-wing talk radio probably wouldn't exist. We'll be able to kiss Glenn Beck and, uh, and uh, Rush Limbaugh goodbye. And maybe some people think that's a good idea, and maybe not, but in the absence of bringing back the fairness doctrine, what are we even talking about? Instead of indulging in conservative talking points, the subcommittee could be holding a substantive hearing about the use of social media. For instance, we could be holding a hearing on the undisputed fact that the Russian government used social media to wage a disinformation campaign to attack our democracy during, during the 2016 election. Inste indeed, in light of the upcoming midterm election, such a hearing would be timely. The Wall Street Journal, a publication not exactly known for its liberal bias, reported just last month that U.S. intelligence officials warned of a, quote, pervasive effort by Russia to disrupt the 2018 election. Yet rather than focus on a real topic of critical concern, protecting the integrity of our elections against foreign interference, the majority has now wasted three hearings on meritless claims of anti-conservative social media bias by private companies that have every right, if they wish, to favor liberals or conservatives' views or anything else they want to. This hearing is remarkable in one sense. The majority seems to have reached a new low in terms of who it has chosen to invite as witnesses. Many of the majority witnesses here today are not just notable for their fringe ideological positions, but for their extreme conduct, their peddling of false conspiracy theories that hurt innocent people, their outright and their outright animus and bigotry toward the civil rights of gays, lesbians, and transgender people. For example, Jim Hoft of the Gateway Pundit website, in an attempt to discredit the cor courageous efforts of the survivors of the hor horrific shooting at Parkland High School in Florida in support of reasonable gun regulations, helped to propagate the false story that these shooting survivors were not real victims, but were instead trained crisis actors. After Mr. Hoff's website published that story, sponsors of a panel on the topic of suppression of conservative views on social media at the Conservative Political Action Conference, an annual gathering of leading conservative activists, demanded that Mr. Hoff be removed from the panel, and ultimately the panel was canceled as a result. In short, Mr. Hoff's association with the crisis act of conspiracy theory was too much even for CPAC, which describes itself as the birthplace of conservatism. 
Yet Mr. Hafta has been invited here today to testify before this subcommittee to disgrace the subcommittee by his presence. Apparently, this subcommittee is less scrupulous than the organizers of CPAC. Are we, as if this were not enough of an embarrassment to our committee, Professor Mike Adams, another majority witness, a professor, has a history of harassing students and making remarks disparaging LGBTQ persons. When challenged about his behavior, Professor Adams tried to hide behind the claim that his statements were merely, quote, satire or exaggerations meant to anger liberals. We should, however, listen to just some of Professor Adams' statements. He mockingly asked whether a 19-year-old student was on a, quote, queer Muslim jihad and wrote, quote, her claims to be a queer Muslim are probably part of an act designed to fit into as many victim categories as possible. This by a professor against a student. He referred to transgender people as mentally ill. And he said that, quote, gay couples do not deserve equal benefits because they do not equally benefit society, close quote. Political correctness run amok? No, simple bigotry. Also invited to testify here today is Alliance Defending Freedom, an organization that represented Professor Adams in his free speech claim against his university and which continues to advance the outrageous argument that the Constitution's free exercise clause permits business owners to discriminate against LGBTQ persons or other people they choose to discriminate against. I must note that their willingness to, prevent, prevent, to represent Professor Adams calls into question the integrity of the argument that they are simply defending religious liberty rather than invidious discrimination. Finally, the majority's argument that conservative views are being suppressed is undermined by the fact that the witnesses appear to have a wide audience for their views. For instance, both Mr. Hoft and Professor Adams have had no problem leveraging the internet, and in, Prof. Adam, and in Professor Adams' case, his taxpayer-funded perch at a public university to connect with like-minded followers. The very fact that we are holding this hearing today refutes the claim that conservative viewpoints are not being adequately heard by society or reflected by American political institutions. Today's hearing is being held because conservative Republicans currently control the House of Representatives, not to mention the Senate, the presidency, and the majority of state legislatures and governorships. This is hardly evidence of the suppression and victimization of conservatives or their views. But many conservatives conveniently ignore these facts. The truth is that despite conservatives' dominance of our government, they continue cultivating the notion that they are the true victims and honing resentment of cultural elites, in quotes, among their base, a cynical tactic that has undergirded conservative political strategy for decades. In the process, they are only too happy to lob insults and criticism at students, universities, or technology companies and to complain about the fact that members of historically marginalized groups seek redress for their real victimhood. And so here we are today at, at what must at what must be the most expensive taxpayer-funded safe space ever to listen yet again to conservative complaints about their <laughs> purported victimhood. This hearing is truly a disgrace as well as a waste of time. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired, and now we'll look forward to the cost-benefit analysis at the conclusion of this topic. I recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Goodlatte, uh, for his opening statement. Well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and before I give my uh, prepared remarks, I just want to say that I am pleased that here uh, in this hearing today, we're going to have that kind of open discussion of differing points of view that it seems that some on the other side of the aisle would like to suppress even here. Uh, at one time, there was likely no other place in the United States that had at one time or another received more praise than Silicon Valley or an American college campus for being bastions of free and open expression. Sometime in our recent past, however, this praise has faded. And today, there are a few settings in America that can identify as being more homogeneous uh, in political thought and belief. According to data cited by the Heterodox Academy, college professors went from leaning left to being almost entirely on the left sometime in the years between 1995 and 2010. Likewise, according to a working paper based on a survey by political scientists at Stanford University, Silicon Valley, in terms of voting, is one of the most strongly Democratic-leaning areas in the nation. However, I would be less concerned about which party is most represented in these settings if there wasn't also a glaring absence of competing viewpoints. Indeed, in their present state, these settings appear to be examples of what happens when homogeneous groups of people begin to purposefully root out people who challenge their beliefs. Silicon Valley, for example, has been called a self-made echo chamber. Greg Lukianoff, 
who has testified before this committee and Professor Jonathan Haidt have both identified a movement on college campuses to scrub campuses clean of words, ideas, and subjects that might cause discomfort or give offense. The trend towards uniformity in thought and belief and the means to enforce it should be alarming to all of us as individuals and collectively to us as a nation. College is a time for students to learn, to appreciate viewpoints that may be different from their own. And we as a society will suffer if colleges are allowed to filter the views of their professor proffer and relegate student expression to obscure designated areas on campus. Likewise, if social media platforms are allowed to filter content that does not comply with the company's beliefs, society will suffer from a less tolerant and misinformed populace. Today's hearing will offer insight into this problem and will certainly bear on how Congress addresses these issues. With that, I want to thank all of our witnesses in attendance today, and I look forward to their testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank Chairman of the full committee, Mr. Goodlad, and uh, the, uh, the uh, other members of the committee for their opening statements. Without objection, other members' opening statements will be made part of the record. I will um, now uh, introduce our first panel of witnesses. Our first witness is Dr. Mike Adams, a professor at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. And our second witness is Dr. Peter Wood, the president of the National Association of Scholars. Our third witness is Mike Simkovic, a professor of law and accounting at the University of Southern California Gould School of Law. And uh, then our fourth witness in, in, is Dr. Tim Grossclose, um, who is a professor at, at George Mason University. Um, so uh, all doctors and uh, I think all professors, uh, the light switch will turn from green to yellow. Uh, it'll indicate that you are, have a minute left in your five minutes of testimony. And uh, it is um, the tradition of this committee uh, to ask the witnesses to stand and be sworn in. So if you would please stand, there are four witnesses. And uh, raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give before this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. And uh, I now uh, recognize our first witness, Dr. Adams, uh, for five minutes. Dr. Adams, uh, you may start with your rebuttal if you prefer. Uh, it is an honor to testify uh, before you here today. The reason I'm here before you is that I'm a veteran of a seven and a half year First Amendment lawsuit uh, in which I ultimately prevailed against my university. In 1993, I was hired as a uh, leftist and an atheist by a, a liberal department of sociology and criminology at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. I won my first teaching award in 1996. I won professor of the year in 1998, and I was easily awarded tenure later that year. Uh, but later things changed. Uh, in uh, 1999, I became a registered Republican, and I also returned to Christianity in the year 2000 uh, after winning my second uh, Faculty Member of the Year Award. Um, after 9-11, I was involved in a free speech battle that drew some national media attention. Uh, that controversy began when I was accused of violating one of our numerous unconstitutional speech policies at the university. And pursuant to that complaint, the university searched through some private emails looking for evidence related to the alleged violation. After the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education intervened, the university lied about the inspection of those private emails, and that's when I decided to start fighting back. In 2003, I started writing a column for townhall.com that focused on exposing threats to free speech on college campuses. In 2005, I started speaking for the Young Americas Foundation. Uh, the speeches often encourage students to make legal challenges to unconstitutional speech policies on their campus. In 2006, I applied for and was denied promotion to full professor. Uh, when I requested an explanation for the denial, I was told that I was deficient in each and every single area of evaluation, teaching, research, and service. In a nutshell, before my change in worldview and the decision to criticize unlawful university policies, I was showered with awards. Afterwards, I was considered deficient in every possible way. Uh, thus, with the encouragement of the Alliance Defending Freedom, I sued for First Amendment retaliation. Uh, after discovery was completed, we had direct evidence of viewpoint discrimination. For example, the university chancellor actually attempted to change the criteria for promotion in order to penalize me for criticizing university policies and practices. Uh, secret investigations were launched in order to determine whether I was engaged in transphobic speech in the classroom. 
and my avowed Marxist feminist department chair actually tampered with faculty evaluations of my fitness for promotion. In the face of direct evidence of viewpoint discrimination, not to mention evidence tampering, the university should have settled the case. Instead, they argued that they had the right to engage in viewpoint discrimination. The university claimed that my speeches for YAF and my articles for townhall.com were transformed from protected speech into official duties as soon as I mentioned them on my promotion application. Thus, they argue that it was permissible for them to engage in viewpoint discrimination. Initially, unfortunately, the district court agreed and the judge dismissed my case. Um, but next, we decided to appeal our case to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Richmond, and there we won a unanimous opinion stating that my columns and speeches retained the full protection of the First Amendment. So seven years into the conflict, we finally had a jury trial, and it took the jury less than two hours of deliberation to rule in my favor. I was awarded promotion to full professor and $50,000 in back pay. Uh, my attorneys were awarded $710,000 in legal fees. As bad as my ordeal was, students on the campuses that I visit have it much worse. They are routinely confined to unconstitutional speech zones, and within them, they are routinely punished under unconstitutional speech codes. Generally speaking, they don't know that the university is violating their rights. And to make matters worse, administrators routinely deceive the students about the scope of their constitutional rights. And this brings me to my central point in the testimony, which is the need for accountability for universities that knowingly violate the Constitution. During the Obama administration, we saw something that was absolutely unprecedented. Under the guise of enforcing Title IX, the Department of Education actually made the receipt of federal funding, funding contingent upon depriving students accused of sexual assault of basic constitutional protections. Now I believe it's time for us to reverse course and make the receipt of federal funding contingent upon honoring the Constitution rather than violating the Constitution. And I hope that the discussion on specifically how to do that will begin today. That's why I'm here. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Adams. I uh, appreciate your testimony. The chair now recognizes Dr. Wood for your five minutes. Dr. Wood. Thank you. Intellectual freedom is the bedrock of our republic. Now, as someone who uses words carefully, or at least tries to, let me say right away that that is a metaphor. Intellectual freedom is not literally bedrock or any kind of stone. What I really mean is that intellectual freedom is the foundation of other essential freedoms, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of having our own opinions and freedom of inquiry. Without intellectual freedom, voting makes no sense. If we can't think for ourselves, we are just engaged in making empty gestures. And without intellectual freedom, education is just indoctrination, bedrock a metaphor. But saying foundation doesn't much advance things. Foundation is a metaphor, too. In fact, it's very difficult, maybe impossible, to talk about intellectual freedom without metaphors. Now, why is that? I'm an anthropologist, not a philosopher, so I have only a guess. Intellectual freedom means the ability to step outside your village or in your imagination to separate yourself at least a little from your own tribe long enough to ask whether the things you've always been told are true are actually true. Now, those things might actually be true, but if you step far enough outside the village to meet people who believe something else, the world suddenly becomes a more complicated place. In 1776, a handful of British colonists stepped far enough outside the village of England to question whether they really needed a king. The rest is, as they say, history. America has been born in skepticism as well as idealism, and intellectual freedom is the combination of those two things. Skepticism that all the important questions have already been answered adequately, idealism that people of goodwill and determination could ask the questions for themselves and seek better and perhaps more truthful answers. That's why intellectual freedom is the bedrock or the foundation of other freedoms and our, of our republic as a whole. We've even developed a specialized institution to advance intellectual freedom on behalf of the rest of society. That is the university. 
Intellectual freedom, however, like any other powerful force, has to be used wisely. You don't step outside your village to plunge off a cliff or into quicksand. Now, one of the biggest dangers that comes with intellectual freedom is that it implies the freedom to turn against itself. It rejects an old doctrine as mere bigotry or idol worship, and the next minute it has a brand new bigotry and a shiny new idol. That, I fear, is where we are right now. It's where we've landed today, especially in our universities. In my written testimony, I reviewed 15 recent cases of college professors and other prominent intellectuals who were shut down on campus because they ran into this new bigotry and idol worship. Some of the 15 have prevailed, as has Professor Adams. And I'm pleased that Professor John McAdams, his namesake at Marquette University, is back on the job after the Wisconsin Supreme Court reprimanded Marquette for suppressing McAdams' academic freedom. But in most of the other cases that I've mentioned, the new academic tyranny continues to dominate. It's a tyranny with many weapons at its disposal. Some have already been mentioned, but let's say speech codes, bias response teams, labeling free speech as microaggression or as hate speech, imposing trigger warnings on teachers, waving the flag of cultural appropriation, attacking people for implicit bias, free speech zones, and beyond that, disinvitations or non-invitations, deselection of conservatives from faculty searches, forced withdrawals of published papers, we've had several of those recently, negative tenure and promotion decisions. Beyond that, groupthink, trial by accusation, which might sound familiar, labeling as racist any opinion with which you disagree. And beyond that, treating intellectual freedom itself as a form of illegitimate privilege that favors whites or the majority or the powerful or somebody other than me. The new tyranny or the new tribalism has been on college campuses and nurtured there. It was, it's its home ground, but it hasn't stayed there. The claims of victimhood and the rule by accusation and that are its chief characteristics have spread to the wider culture and is now all too clear become part of our politics. They drive the polarization of our culture. The answer to this, I will concur with Professor Adams, is a new constitutionalism. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wood. The uh, chair would now recognize Professor Simkovic for his testimony. Professor Simkovic. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts on intellectual freedom and the, role of and the role of universities in civil society. I'm expressing my individual views and not those of my employer, the University of Southern California. Albert Einstein once described universities as temples of, silent, of science, where a finely tempered nature longs to escape from the painful crudity of everyday life into the world of objective perception and thought. This may be compared to the silence of high mountains, where the eye ranges freely through the still pure air and finally traces out the restful contours apparently built for eternity. There is no such thing as right wing or left wing physics or chemistry or mathematics. Universities do not and should not strive to track the shifting median policy positions between competing political parties or kowtow to the preferences of donors or political leaders. Universities instead must strive to promote rigorous, objective research using the best data, the most qualified personnel, and the best analytic tools available. To help protect researchers' independence and insulate them from undue pressure, universities grant academic tenure. Nothing comparable is available to think tank researchers or journalists who can be and have been fired for their views. To help academics correct our own mistakes, we use peer review, replication, internal debate, and other checks. Universities' efforts to expand human knowledge have contributed to innovation and economic growth and to rising levels of prosperity and longevity. Education boosts earnings and employment, reduces burdens on public services, and helps fund the government by increasing payroll and income tax revenues. Ideology and political representativeness are not part of academic institutions' mission. Academia is inherently skeptical of dogma or party platforms. Scientists believe in the pursuit of objective knowledge and truth, in adherence to standards of rigor and fairness, and in the elevation of facts above ideological or political priors. There is no such thing as liberal or conservative science. Universities seek to foster critical thinking, 
communication and problem solving skills not to indoctrinate students into a particular set of political beliefs. Disagreement between knowledgeable scientific experts and median political views often do not suggest political bias on the part of scientists, but rather an effort by think tanks, media organizations, interest groups, and politicians to inappropriately politicize science and scientific issues. For example, the causes and consequences of climate change are scientific issues. The likely economic harm from such changes and the costs of preventing or mitigating them are also scientific issues. So are the adverse health consequences from air and water pollution or the health effects of smoking. So is the question of whether tax cuts can generate enough economic growth to reduce the debt to GDP ratio. While scientific questions can have political and policy implications, scientific inquiry should not be politicized. The best evidence should be analyzed with the best methods and the implications and degree of uncertainty honestly conveyed to policymakers and the public. But according to scientific experts, many scientific issues have been inappropriately politicized when scientific evidence threatened private sector profits or government budgets. These issues include the causes and effects of climate change, the health risks of pollution, and the dangers of tobacco use. According to a Pew survey, nearly 80% of scientists believe that previous federal administrations suppressed government scientists' findings for political reasons. Many scientists worry that the suppression of scientific findings for political reasons is becoming more common. Note that the Pew sample consists overwhelmingly of natural or hard scientists in fields such as medical sciences, chemistry, physics, and geosciences. Pew sample included those who work in private industry as well as those who work in government and universities. Recently, there have been systematic efforts by some members of Congress to weaken the role of science in informing agency rulemaking and increase the role of political actors. Some politicians have also sought to prevent government agencies from collecting basic data about demographics, the environment, health and safety, and the economy, even if de-identified to protect individual privacy. Today, threats to academic freedom can come from powerful donors, political leaders, and outside pressure groups who sometimes seek to subtly, or not so subtly, influence ostensibly neutral and unbiased academic research to further their own business interests or other political preferences. The best way to protect universities from undue influence may be to secure and expand revenue sources that are indifferent to or cannot sway the conclusions of academic research. This is analogous to the approach we take to try to protect the independence of members of the Federal Judici Judiciary or the Federal Reserve. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Simkovic, and the Chair would now recognize Dr. Grossclose Gross -close, uh, for his testimony. Doctor? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Grossclose. Since 2014, I've been a professor of economics at George Mason University. Before that, for 11 and a half years, I was a professor of political science at UCLA. Two research projects that I've conducted are especially relevant to the problems within academia that I plan to discuss today. One of those projects examines media bias and tries to measure it quantitatively. The main conclusion of, of my research basically was that conservatives have been largely correct on this issue. According to my findings, almost all mainstream media outlets really do have a left of center bias. The second research project sprang from some administrative work that I did at UCLA. From 2005 to 2008, I was a member of the university's faculty oversight committee for undergraduate admissions. I saw some suspicious and possibly illegal activity while on the committee. I asked members of the admissions staff to give me data so I could test my suspicions. They refused. I consequently resigned from the committee in protest, and eventually I wrote a book, which is now entitled Cheating, colon, An Insider's Report on the Use of Race in Admissions at UCLA. My written statement lists eight an anecdotes. Let me give, in the interest of time, quick summaries of just three of those anecdotes. Anecdote one, a young professor from another university gave a seminar at UCLA. Afterward, I told him, you know who would love your results? Ann Coulter. I kind of know her. Would you mind if I send her an email? I bet she might write about your research. The researcher, the young researcher quickly replied, oh, please don't do that. That could only hurt my career. Anecdote two. At UCLA, I was denied what I thought would be an automatic promotion. I'm convinced that the reason was due to my research on media bias and UCLA admissions, specifically because the results of those research projects displeased 
uh, because they displease progressives. If the data just would have produced the opposite results, ones that would have pleased progressives, I'm certain that I would have been granted the promotion. Because of that promotion denial, my wife and I decided it would be best if I left UCLA. We could see that I would not be treated fairly if I remained at, at UCLA. Anecdote three, however, it's listed as anecdote four in my written statement. Two friends who are political science professors examine the extent to which Barack Obama's skin color affected voters' decisions. They found, perhaps surprisingly, that his skin color had a net positive effect. That is, although some people voted against Obama because he is black, more people voted for him because he is black. The two professors presented the research at a conference of political scientists where they received an extremely hostile reaction. They eventually abandoned the research. They never published it and they no longer list the working paper on their websites. Although one should always be careful in trying to assess motives, I strongly suspect that the professors abandoned the research because they knew it could hurt their careers. Conclusion. I believe that these anecdotes illustrate some general principles of academic research. First, if you're bold enough to report results that displease progressives, there's a good chance that that will, will jeopardize your career. Second, many professors understanding that principle wisely squelch or fail to report results if they know that the results will displease progressives. Third, and perhaps most disturbing, all this means that the results that we, the public, get to see are not a representative sample of all the results of academic research. Instead, the sample that we get to see has been distorted and cherry-picked. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grossclose. Gross um, the chair would now um, proceed to questioning. I'll now recognize myself for the opening uh, five minutes. And I'd like to turn first uh, to Dr. Adams. Yes. And, uh, and Dr. Adams, um, you won a lawsuit and uh, I guess I'm struck by the attorney fees versus the settlement that you received, uh, yes. $50,000. Was that adequate compensation for what you went through? Uh, actually, it was. Uh, it was, it was uh, uh, back pay, basically, uh, for the... It, what's interesting about the situation was that the promotion was only uh, uh, to full professor was $5,000 per year. Uh, which makes it all the more interesting that the university insisted upon spending the time, uh, kind of effort and time that they did um, uh, in fighting it, which I think was a, a poor use of taxpayer money. Well, uh, thank you. And uh, I would say, who gets to decide then what is hate speech or what is in inhibition of speech on a college campus? Uh, that's what this is about. And apparently the court decided that you had more freedom than the university thought you should have. But who should get to decide and how does the society sort it out you're looking for a solution is why you're here and I'm looking for your advice. Uh, we reject the concept of hate speech altogether just as the Supreme Court did last year in the science decision. Uh, that's what we do and when universities come along and try to paper over the Constitution, uh, we hold them accountable for doing that and, and that's a, a, a very serious concern that I have uh, about my university and about universities, universities in general uh, that they will fight these kinds of lawsuits and they will, because they're playing with other people's money, mm -hmm. Uh, they will run up six and even seven digit legal bills and not really worry about it and there's no consequence whatsoever. Uh, I think we need to uh, attach a consequence to this kind of violation of, uh, would you like me to elaborate on that just a little bit? Um, uh, I was taking a look, for example, at the 424B uh, form that the Department of Education requires uh, every single university president to sign off every single time uh, that there is a non-construction grant for research or for academic programs. There are probably 15 different promises that the university ha president has to sign off on. We are not engaged in human trafficking. We are not engaged in violating env environmental laws. It is high time that we added a 16th category which says that the university has to promise that they are not engaged in violations of the First Amendment in order to receive any grant money whatsoever. And if they sign off on that, and if at the end of the year there's a judgment against them and they receive federal funding saying they weren't violating people's First Amendment rights when they were, turn them over to the Department of Justice for fraud. That's my view. That's a proposal uh, worthy of consideration. I would say, is there anything that was uh, said here on this panel that uh, you'd like to have an opportunity to rebut? Uh, you mean in the introdu introductory statements? Yes. 
Uh, Congressman uh, Nadler made some statements. I would like to rebut them, but he has fled, so I didn't have the opportunity. I'm sorry he didn't have more courage. Oh, okay, well, thank, thank you, um, Dr. Adams. Then I turn then to um, Dr. Wood, and you made a statement that surprised me uh, when you said that if we don't have freedom of speech that there really isn't point in having elections. Could you care to expand on that thought a bit? Sure. Uh, intellectual freedom means making decisions based on as much evidence and reason as you can without the ability to hear what the other side has to say in any dispute where there is more than one side. Uh, one is reduced to just making a reflexive gesture. There is no thought content to it at all. Uh, party loyalty might be a nice thing in some circumstances, but I prefer to see party loyalty uh, mixed up with a little bit of careful thought about what the alternatives are. So I don't think we should have uh, elections uh, essentially conducted by robots. We need human beings who encounter ideas and think about them and decide what's the best course for the country. And you mentioned, I believe, that you're an anthropologist? Yes, I am. And so I'd ask you this question. This is more about our, our society, but there are trends that come for different reasons. And, and that, that would be this, that I mean, I, we're, from my perspective, I think we have reasonable people that are generally on the right side of the aisle that will take data and facts and, and the exact sciences that Professor Simkovic mentioned and use that as the foundation for their process. And it looks to me like the other side is pushing emotion and feelings against facts and data. Have you examined that in any way that, it would, uh, that you could help illuminate the knowledge of this panel with? Uh, I wrote a book titled A Bee in the Mouth, Anger in America Now a few years ago, which I think bears on this. Our, our willingness to uh, find a kind of illusory strength in feeling outraged or angry all the time has become a, a sort of drug in the American mind. Uh, I don't think it's limited to people on the left, but right now it appears to have become uh, a, a sort of fixed thing on campus that students and quite a few faculty members take their uh, reason for being in uh, expression of anger. Uh, so yes, emotion is getting the upper hand of uh, serious inquiry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wood. I see that my time has expired and the chair would now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin, a professor in his own right for his five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to start by saying I, I don't think our colleague uh, fled for lack of courage. Everybody's got a bunch of committee and subcommittee meetings going on and he's the ranking member of judiciary. I'm sure he would love to pursue the debate with you later, Dr. Adams, and certainly uh, I would like to do it. Mm -hmm. um, let me start with th this. Um, th there, there's a complaint that is often made by those on the right mm -hmm. that certain groups indulge in whining and victimology. Mm -hmm. But now that complaint is being turned around on you guys and the claim is being made, you guys are victimologists, you are indulging in self-pity, you're constantly whining about how you're being silenced on campus and silenced in corporations and so on. Um, do any of you identify as whiners or do you feel like you're victimologists? And if not, then I want to talk about concretely what we can do to deal with free speech. Dr. Wood, with you, do you feel like you're a whiner? No, I don't. I, I publish a, um, a quarterly journal called Academic Questions, and one of the principles in it is no whining. Okay, Dr. Adams, are you a whiner? Are you no, just I, whining I, about what no, happened? No, I fight back. Okay. Quite su successfully, so. Okay, and are, are, are you a whiner? Somewhat. Yeah. Uh, l l let me explain. Uh, when I was at um, at UCLA, yeah. um, I noticed some professors would get they would come become activists, and, and my wife and I secretly we would we would call them losers. And I found myself at the end of my tenure at, at UCLA when I'm complaining about some of these things, I'm having to whine, and I'm having to become somewhat of an activist. I never intended that. When I went into academia, my plan was to be a teacher and a researcher. Well, I appreciate your candor. And I, about and that. I had to so tell my wife, I'm becoming one of those losers. And part of the well, that's part of the reason I left. Because UCLA. you felt like you were being discriminated against. And you felt and I, it was causing me to okay, be a well, whiner. Me, okay, so I said, no, I'll just leave. I'll do something about this. All right, forgive me for hurrying us along. I, I only understand. got five yeah. minutes. So. Yeah. But uh, if we could transform the whining into something concrete, I think Dr. Adams ventured a suggestion about how there should be a law which requires campuses to respect free speech. That's a concrete, tangible legislative proposal. 
Um, mm -hmm. Let's start with this. Should that apply just to public universities like the one that you were able successfully to sue, Dr. Adams, or should it apply across the board as quickly as possible? In my view, just to public universities. Just public. Dr. Wood, what do you think? I believe that uh, every university that receives federal funding should be subject to some degree of oversight on Public and private, secular, like religious, all of them together. Very good. Yes. Professor Simkovic. Uh, I think that the best way to protect academic freedom is with tenure and insulation from outside pressure. I'd like to see that extended from universities to think tanks and, frankly, media organizations. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, institutions that help generate knowledge in our society um, have the ability to act with integrity and independence and not be fearful of retaliation and having their budgets cut. And you agree that that should apply to private universities and colleges as well. For example, in Washington, D.C., we have Catholic University and Georgetown University which have banned pro-choice speakers or forbidden uh, pro-choice or gay groups at different points in their history, should they be required as private entities to respect the First Amendment rights of all of their students, or should we say the, the relevant First Amendment rights are those of the bureaucrats who run the universities? Yeah, so um, I, uh, again, don't believe that there's a need for federal legislation dictating policy at, at universities. I okay. think it's sufficient for universities to protect uh, Professor the Professor Gross, okay, fair. where are you on this? Uh, definitely, I think with public universities, I think currently it would be constitutional to say you must protect free speech. If you're not a public university, it's not clear. I, no, I think but, but the question is, should we adopt okay. a free speech policy? For example, I don't know if you ever read uh, William F. Buckley's God and Man at Yale. I have. But he took the position that Yale should be propounding Christianity, which would be much to Dr. Adams' liking, undoubtedly, um, and it should be propounding certain conservative views, and it should simply eliminate the professors who don't agree. Should Yale have the right to do that as a private institution, or should we be able to, or should we cut off money to Yale research funds if they discriminate based on people's politics? I think it would be constitutional and also reasonable if Congress passed a statute to that effect, and if I were a congressman, I would vote for such a okay, statute. And it should apply whether you call yourself religious or not, because uh, right now what's happening right. is a lot of- As long as you get federal funding. If yeah, you get as long as you get funding, federal funding. Yes. And Dr. Adams, do you agree with that too? Uh, no. You no, don't, I well, do why not? No, I no, thought the, you were a big champion the, of free speech. No the, no, the private institutions should just be honest about what they are. For well, example, leave aside honesty, should they have the right to discriminate based on free speech? In other words, should they discriminate based on viewpoint? I mean, say, say you were at a private university, it would be fine for the university to fire you for what you wrote or to deny you a promotion? Well, religious schools, of course. The well, gentleman's forgetting time has religious, expired. just say a the private the school. I mean, Yale's a religious school. Right. The gentleman's time well, has used expired. To be. The witness used be allowed to, be. to answer the question. Sorry. Sorry? It used to be, but it's not anymore. Well, in its eyes, it is. So should Yale have the right <laughs> to deny you a promotion because it says it's a religious school and your attitudes or beliefs are out of keeping with its own particular religious views? Uh, they should just be honest about what they forget advertise. Forget being honest. Should, should they have a right? Honest. Gentleman's okay. time has expired. I can't forget being honest. Well, you're not answering my question. I'm in the wrong hearing, I guess. The gentleman's time has expired, and uh, the chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Goodlatte of Virginia, for his five minutes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just ask the, the panelists, so we'll go right down the line. Uh, are you familiar with uh, legislation introduced by Senator Hatch in the Senate which would amend the Higher Education Act of 1965 to ensure that public institutions of higher education protect expressive activities in the outdoor areas on campus. Not familiar with it? Well, I guess I don't need, well, I'll just ask you whether you think that's a good idea or not. It basically uh, would uh, amend the Higher Education Act to uh, make a provision that uh, allows for the bringing of uh, lawsuits and the preservation of those lawsuits even after an individual graduates uh, when they're denied the right to uh, engage in expressive activity uh, in outdoor areas. Yeah, speech zones are a big problem on college campuses, but there's a disagreement about how that should be handled. In the state of North Carolina, we passed a law, HB 527, uh, in which we got rid of, uh, essentially in one fell swoop, those unconstitutional uh, speech zones. Uh, so I do agree with the legislative solutions. The question is whether that should be done on the, on the state level or on the federal level. I think probably on the state level. Dr. Wood. 
The uh, Higher Education Act already has in it, as Title I, a pretty strong affirmation of academic and intellectual freedom. It's not backed up with any particular measures. It sounds like this act would uh, strengthen a provision that already exists. Um, the only issue about For Lots of time what happens is the student graduates, and therefore uh, the restriction is no longer applicable to them because they've left the institution. Uh, before the lawsuit can ever mature and uh, and ripen, would okay. you would you support legislation that would preserve that right of action so it can get to a conclusion and be heard? Yes, Professor, Congressman, there are between four thousand and five thousand institutions of higher education in the United States. Um, many of them have internal policies governing freedom of speech, and they attempt to create an atmosphere which is conducive to research and conducive to learning. And they come to different conclusions about what that means in terms of balancing robust debate uh, with an environment which is, um, enables concentration and contemplation. Um, I don't believe that it would be appropriate to federalize this issue. I believe that universities it is federal. are capable. It's the First capable. Amendment of the United States Constitution. I believe that universities are. And there's a the Higher Education Act, which is a federal statute. Yes, I believe that it's important for the government to fund education, to provide opportunities for people for advancement in their careers, to fund scientific research. But I do not feel that it is appropriate to politicize or centralize control over the production of knowledge. Well, well who's centralizing it? Is it the institution that uh, you're referring to that's centralizing control? They're between 4,000 and 5,000 institutions. It's not very centralized, Congressman. No, no I'm talking about each in individual institution, particularly if they're a public institution, uh, whether or not uh, the administration there should be able to say, you got to go to this one little place if you want to uh, freely express your ideas. Yeah, so, Congressman, there is tenure to protect academic freedom, which means that administrators cannot yeah, control what the argument. faculty I'm talking about are. Students having the ability to freely express themselves in outdoor areas on college campuses. So, again, Congressman, um, the University of California at Berkeley spent $4 million on security costs to bring four speakers to campus. Uh, the Chancellor's Commission uh, concluded that this was not an effective use of taxpayer dollars. That is money that could have been spent training engineers, training nurses, researching cures for life-threatening illness. Uh, and it was spent for security for four speakers. Now, I believe that universities have a right to use their resources in the way which they believe best promotes their mission of promoting science and education. Even and there are, plenty, there are plenty of opportunities for the expression uh, of different ideas. There we have, I mean, university campuses are not very large. Anyone who is not invited to campus has the opportunity to rent space just off campus, and anyone who's interested can attend. Everyone has access to the internet, everyone and has access to television, everyone has access to books, everyone has access that, uh, to. Don't have to respect free speech rights of uh, groups of students on the campus or individuals students on the campus? They do respect free speech rights, but universities are not public parks. They are places of learning and places of education. Down to the last seconds of my. I think I completely agree, and I, th I think that the Constitution are already says you, if you're a public university, you cannot abridge freedom of speech. I th and I think it's, I'm not a lawyer, I think it's the 14th Amendment that says these uh, freedoms in the first, in the Bill of Rights are granted to the states, therefore the states cannot make laws, and that would include public universities, that would abridge freedom of speech. So I think you're exactly right. If you only have a restricted space where you have freedom of speech, that, that would seem like that would violate the, uh, the Constitution to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gentleman returns his time, and uh, this concludes uh, panel one of our hearing here today, and I want to thank all the witnesses for your testimony. And um, I'd like to then ask you um, if um, we could be seated with the following, uh, the, for the other witnesses that follow each of you. So thank you again, gentlemen. appreciate your testimony.
mission in the previous game. Well, as we uh, as we continue, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the four of the five witnesses that are here, and uh, we'll see if the fifth witness uh, does arrive. And I'm very pleased uh, first to introduce our first witness, and that's Jim Hoft, who's the founder and editor of the Gateway Pundit. And our second witness is Adriana Cohen, uh, who is a syndicated columnist and a radio host for the Boston Herald Radio. And our third witness is Jeremy Tedesco, the Vice President of U.S. Advocacy for the Alliance of Defending Freedom. And then uh, our fourth witness is Professor Ari Waldman, Professor of Law at the New York Law School, uh, Professor Waldman. And perfect timing on arrival would be our fifth and final witness, which is Harmi Dillon a partner of the Dillon Law Group Incorporated. I'd like to welcome all of you and uh, let you know that um, the, the green light that you will have at the beginning of your five minutes testimony will be uh, four minutes long and the amber light will be one minute long and we'd ask you to uh, try to wrap up your testimony about that time and uh, we also want to give you enough latitude to complete the thought or at least the sentence depending on how intense our timing gets here today. And uh, so I'd ask each of the witnesses if you would stand and raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give before this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Let the record show that witnesses all responded in the affirmative. And uh, I would now uh, recognize our first witness, um, that would be Mr. Hoft of Gateway Pundit. Um, Mr. Hoff, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman King and subcommittee members for organizing this important hearing today. Your colleagues in Congress have provided a lot of airtime recently to prominent CEOs of tech companies who are trying to put me and others with my politics out of business. I thank you for allowing me to speak today instead of the perpetrators. My testimony today is how the purification of thought has been accomplished by one company with a monopoly hold on the public comments in our internet era. My name is Jim Hoft. I'm the owner and founder of the Gateway Pundit website based in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm known in my business for making some good headlines. Here's today's headline I bring to you. In the run-up of the 2016 election, Americans got to choose what they would read on Facebook. Today, Facebook chooses for them. I grew up in Iowa and I understand the pulse, the struggles, the hopes and dreams of middle America. I came to find out that Facebook doesn't like my type. I launched Gateway Pundit in 2004 as a way to report on news that I didn't see in mainstream media. At first I had two or three daily readers, my twin brother Joe and a friend Chris. I was humbled and amazed to see our content grow in popularity over the years to nearly one million views a day currently, uh, thanks to promotions by Michelle Malkin, Glenn Reynolds, The Drudge Report, and several others. We provide news coverage and opinion that Americans cannot find elsewhere. There's no way to account for the demand of our content. On a shoestring budget, we offered something the American people desired, real news. We were ranked by Harvard and Columbia Journalism Review as the fourth most influential conservative publisher in the 2016 election. Our readers, smart, patriotic, and diverse, have not given up on the promise of America. This is who I represent today in speaking to you. 2016 was a transformative year. This was the first election where Americans rejected in mass their legacy media options and turn to the freedom of choice and lack of filter on social media instead, through which they would share, comment on, and connect with uh, websites like ours. The Gateway Pundit business cultivated its audience on Facebook, spending roughly $70,000 in advertising in 2015, resulting in 600,000 likes for our page. Over the past 19 months, the Gateway Pundit saw a decline in Facebook traffic from 24% of our total website traffic 
to 2% of our website traffic currently. That, that is an 80% decrease in traffic from Facebook. Recently, we analyzed traffic numbers for some of the top conservative publishers in America. What we found was simply shocking. Just as Gateway Pundit has been eliminated by Facebook from being seen by its readers, Facebook eliminated 93% of combined referral traffic to these websites from January 2017 to May 2018. The site Western Journal and other conservative websites under their umbrella had a more, more than a billion page views in 2016. Since then, the organization has lost 75% of its Facebook traffic. Likewise, Clicked Media, which hosts over 60 conservative websites, lost 400 million page views from Facebook in the last six months when compared to the prior year. With just these two organizations, they've lost more than 1.5 billion page views in the past year from Facebook. After the election, Facebook began making algorithm changes to ensure that conservatives no longer had an option for their users. Two studies released in March 2018 confirm this. The first study is by outline organization that found conservative publishers were hit the hardest by Facebook uh, algorithm changes and that Gateway Pundit was actually hit the hardest. The second study by Western Journal revealed the same startling statistics. Further, this study found that liberal publishers actually increased by 2% in traffic at, during the same uh, time frame. In fact, we found that every prominent conservative website from 2016 has either had their Facebook traffic diminished significantly or entirely eliminated. Again, we found that every prominent conservative website from 2016 has either had their Facebook traffic diminished significantly or entirely eliminated. If Facebook were to hold a book burning, they wouldn't have been half as successful as they have been eliminating contrary points of view from being accessed by the American people. In fact, book burning is benign when compared to what Facebook has silently done to restrict and eliminate diversity of thought. In book burnings, you can see the flames and watch the words disappear. In our case, we were silently and effectively disappeared. Several top conservative sites are already out of business. If our fourth estate is to remain an effective check as our founders intended, we must ensure that political purification of thoughts by one communication corporation, Facebook, is given ample competition. Today, that competition is being eliminated. Tomorrow, there will be only a few sanctioned voices for the American people. This is not America. Thank you, Mr. Hoff. Uh, and I, now the chair would recognize Ms. Adriana Cohen for her testimony. Members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here this morning to share my personal experience with social media censorship and discrimination. I am a conservative opinion columnist with the Boston Herald. My popular columns championing traditional Republican values and the Trump administration are nationally syndicated. I'm also a Boston Herald radio host who interviews congressional lawmakers, leaders of government, including the President of the United States, who's, who's been a guest on my radio show. I'm also a Fox News commentator who appears regularly on the network. I am being discriminated against by social media networks who are censoring my conservative columns, radio interviews, and posts on its platform. This is a daily occurrence on Twitter and has been happening for a long time. My well-received conservative column is often the front page feature in the Boston Herald and gets heavy traction and readership except on Twitter. Virtually every week, if not bi-weekly, when the Herald publishes my column, it becomes the number one most read and shared piece on the Herald's website or close to it. But the same exact column isn't hardly getting any traction on Twitter uh, when I post it there because it's secretly being censored by Twitter, which is why many of my Twitter followers report they don't see my columns and posts in their feeds. For example, my Boston Herald column titled Russia Truth Coming Out, dated May 22nd, 2018 was the number one trending piece on the Herald site. It got 62,300 Facebook shares uh, on the Herald site and hundreds of comments. But the same column on Twitter got virtually zero traction. To be exact, it got only 11 retweets, 26 likes, and two comments. On April 5th, my column titled Trump, Exactly Who We Need Versus China was the number one trending piece again at the Boston Herald website, getting heavy traction and engagement, but on Twitter, the same exact column got nine likes, five shares. Last week, September 20th, my column titled No Holds Barred 
in Democrats' attacks was, again, the number one trending piece on the Herald site, but on Twitter, the same column got 15 likes and six retweets. This is just a small sample of the blatant censorship and egregious discrimination I am being subjected to on a regular basis on Twitter. Please note that not only my popular columns leading the Herald's website and getting heavy traction or readership there, it's often picked up by other major media nationally, including the USA Today, the Washington Post, Real Clear News, Fox News, and many other outlets, and getting significant traction virtually everywhere except Twitter. I can provide scores of additional examples, but given the limited time I have for testimony, I am sharing just a tiny fraction of the censorship I am experiencing on Twitter. I am happy to provide additional corroborating evidence for the record upon request. I have over 16,000 Twitter followers, and the vast majority of them aren't seeing my columns and posts because they're being blocked by Twitter. Here are a few examples. On March 25th, 2018, I asked Tony Schaefer, he's blue check mark verified, in a direct message if he's seeing my columns in his feed. Mr. Schaefer replied, quote, nope, not seeing them, end quote. On March 25th, 2018, I asked Dan Bongino, blue check mark verified, if he's seeing my columns in his feed. Mr. Bongino responded, quote, I have not been seeing the columns. They're messing with me too. It's a cesspool, end quote. On September 5th, 2018, I sent another message to Dan Bongino on Twitter to see if he had seen just a tweet I posted about Nike. Mr. Bongino responded, quote, I didn't see it either, end quote. On September 6th, I asked Tom Borelli, blue check mark verified on Twitter, if he saw my column I posted on Judge Kavanaugh on his Twitter feed. Mr. Borelli responded, quote, I did not see it and I just looked at my feed since last night and didn't see it either, end quote. On June 4th, another Twitter follower of mine, right side of Reagan, told me, quote, I've been following you but you never come up on my feed, FYI, end quote. On March 26th, Jeff Katz told me dire on, via direct message on Twitter, quote, no, not seeing your stuff in my feed, end quote. On September 6th, Steve Tomkowicz uh, posted on Twitter, wow, I check my feed every day and scroll way down. I can't remember the last time I've seen a tweet from you. This is the first on my feed in quite a while, end quote. On March 29th, Michael Santoro said, quote, I follow you but never see your columns. This happens with other conservatives I follow, end quote. On September 6th, Susie Light posted on Twitter, I never, never in capitalizations, see your tweets unless you say something like this. I'm sorry this happens to you, end quote. There are many other Twitter followers who tell me they don't see my post in their feeds. I am submitting additional evidence for the record. Uh, I could go on and on for an hour of screenshots and quotes of my Twitter followers who, who tell me that they did not see my tweets or columns in their feeds. I asked the committee to consider this scenario. Imagine if the phone company refused to connect phone calls between two parties because they didn't like the, op the opinions expressed in the conversation. This is exactly what Twitter is doing to me and thousands of conservatives like me every single day throughout the nation. This type of egregious censorship is trampling on my constitutional rights, including my rights to free speech. It's also censoring lawmakers and heads of government agencies because I interview important members of our government and often include excerpts from those radio interviews in my columns. That means when social media networks block distribution of my conservative columns and podcasts, they are also censoring members of Congress. This discrimination is hurting the American people who are being denied access to vital information from government, government officials, information that impacts their lives. On my, on Facebook, my posts are also being censored. Many of my Facebook followers tell me they don't see my columns and posts in their feeds. I reached out to Twitter and Facebook for an explanation on multiple occasions and have not received a response. By censoring my columns, podcasts, and television appearances, these social networks are damaging my career as a female columnist, television commentator, commentator and radio personality. They're also hurting other conservative voices also being silenced. And they are hurting the business sector, including my employer, the Boston Herald, the Creator Syndicate, and other outlets who are being denied clicks to its website every time my, my column and content is censored by these social media networks. But most importantly, social media networks are meddling in U.S. elections by allowing its users who possess liberal viewpoints unfettered access to its platforms and voters 
while silencing scores of conservatives. This rigs the electoral system because Twitter and Facebook are giving Democrats the ability to shape public opinion and connect with millions of voters while denying that same opportunity to scores of conservatives, including myself. I've written se several columns on this topic uh, that I'm happy to submit uh, to the committee. Twitter and Facebook are deceiving the American oh, and people. I'd ask you to summarize your testimony, if you could, please. We're over a couple minutes. Oh, okay. S Thanks. Excuse me. So. Um, I just want to say that I've never said anything that's hate speech or anything close to it, so there's no justification whatsoever for social media networks to be silencing a mainstream conservative like myself. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. The Chair would now recognize Mr. Tedesco for his five minutes. Mr. Tedesco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Jeremy Tedesco. I'm Senior Counsel and Vice President of U.S. Advocacy with Alliance Defending Freedom. ADF is one of the nation's most respected legal organizations defending constitutionally protected free speech and free exercise rights for all Americans. Since 2011, ADF has won nine cases before the United States Supreme Court involving issues like legislative prayer, school choice, and the discriminatory treatment of churches. Empirical SCOTUS recently ranked ADF first among the top performing firms in its Supreme Court All-Stars 2013 to 2017 report because ADF won all four of its decisions before the court during the five-year period. In addition to its Supreme Court work, ADF's Center for Academic Freedom has won over 400 victories for free speech, ensuring that the college campus remains a marketplace of ideas for millions of students and faculty. We live in a time when the need for productive civil discourse has perhaps never been more urgent. Yet at the same time, the obstacles to achieving it have never seemed more insurmountable. We appreciate this committee's leadership in fostering a commitment to robust debate and dialogue. ADF, too, is committed to cultivating a society typified by the free speech and free exchange of ideas and respect and tolerance for those with whom we disagree. These deeply rooted constitutional principles are essential in a diverse country like ours. They enable us to peacefully coexist with each other. Sadly, several of the most influential technology giants, many of which are integral to the daily lives of millions of Americans, are endangering the vitality of these core American <coughs> principles. Silicon Valley's digital gatekeepers have frequently represented their platforms as committed to free exp expression and creating an open marketplace of ideas. But as my written testimony details, as, a, as we've heard today, they've broken their promises by restricting conservative and religious speech over and over again. The recent push to restrict what they call hate speech exacerbates this threat because invariably Silicon Valley and others apply the hate speech label to traditional, widely held views they disagree with on a range of important topics like immigration, abortion, marriage, and sexuality. These companies further intensify the threat to conservative and religious speech by collaborating with far-left ad advocacy groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center to enforce their hate speech policies. Commentators across the political spectrum agree that SPLC is a biased, agenda-driven activist group. Kimberly Strassel wrote, SPLC exists to spear conservatives and tags you as a hater if it doesn't agree with your views. Left of Center Politico published an article in which it noted the long-standing criticism that SPLC is becoming more of a partisan progressive hit operation than a civil rights watchdog. SPLC's credibility took another enormous hit recently when it issued a public apology and paid nearly $3.5 million to settle a threatened defamation lawsuit by Muslim reformer Majid Nawaz, who SPLC had falsely labeled an anti-Muslim extremist. Yet despite knowing SPLC's clear, SPLC's clear bias and partisanship, tech companies continue to collectively partner with SPLC and embrace its intentional smear campaign against mainstream conservative and religious views held by millions. These actions contradict these companies' promises to cultivate civil discourse and free exchange of ideas and deceive the members of their online communities and, con and consumers who rely on these promises. ADF itself has already been the victim of this troubling arrangement. Earlier this year, Amazon excluded ADF from the Amazon Smile program, which promises customers that they can donate a small percentage of their purchases to the charitable organization of their choice, solely because SPLC wrongly labels ADF a hate group. Amazon likewise bars many other conservative and religious charities by relying on SPLC's biased labels. This is only the tip of the iceberg on how these companies can impact the marketplace. We know from recent news that they sometimes act in concert, excluding disfavored speakers from multiple pl platforms all at once. 
The power they wield over free expression and information access is deeply troubling and has real world consequences for those caught in the crosshairs. We understand that there is no easy solution to these issues, but at a minimum, Congress should hold additional hearings and use its considerable influence to encourage Silicon Valley companies to abide by their representations. They shouldn't promise an open and robust marketplace of ideas, but then collaborate with biased and discredited groups like the SPLC to shut down one side of an ideological and intellectual debate. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Desco, um, thank you, Mr. Desco. And now the chair recognizes Professor Waldman for your testimony. Professor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me here to testify today. My name is Ari Waldman, and I'm a law professor. I hold a JD from Harvard Law School and a PhD in sociology from Columbia University. For the last eight years, I've studied how technology mediates our daily lives. I study things like when and how we share personal information, how technology design manipulates our online behavior, and how we can make online spaces safe for everyone, and the legal and regulatory environments in which data collectors like Facebook operate. I also study content moderation and the responsibilities of online platforms. Let me note here that although I research and write in this area, I stand on the shoulders of far smarter and more accomplished colleagues, many of whose work I'll cite and rely, rely on here today. A recent article in the magazine Wired made an important observation. To communicate anything, the authors wrote, Facebook can't communicate everything. This has always been true of media platforms. Neither Salon nor the National Review can publish everything. Content moderation rules do not implicate the First Amendment in the traditional sense. We, may have, we all may have a First Amendment right subject to some limitations to say what we want free of government's intervention or censorship. But we don't have a First Amendment right to a private company's amplification of our words, whatever James Woods recently said on Twitter or whatever media personalities might want. So let's discuss for a moment how and why platforms actually moderate content. So first, the, the how. Content moderation is a complex ecosystem of technology and people. Moderation sometimes happens before content is published, in that time between you upload a video and when it's actually published or available online. This process is automatic, using data trains algorithms that screen out things like child pornography or copyrighted material. After publication, moderators either proactively remove content that violates platform rules, either with extremist or terrorist speech, for example, and outsourced talent is supervised by more experienced content moderators, many of whom work outside the US or at call centers. The top level moderation happens back at headquarters by lawyers directly responsible for content moderation policies and training. These moderators work very much like judges would. They are trained to exercise judgment based on rules set out by the platforms. And because these rules were created and promulgated by lawyers, is steeped in the American legal tradition, they reflect the free speech norms many of us learned in law school. Now, why do platforms do this? They are, as you know, under no legal obligation to do so. They have, however, normative and financial incentives to. Every platform designs values into its code. Some social spaces are meant to be overtly uninhibited, like 4chan. One of, the, one of Facebook's central values is, for example, to bring people together. As a result, in, responsibility, in response to manipulation of the platform by fake news sources, Facebook redesigned its newsfeed algorithm to privilege and prioritize posts from our friends rather than from media or business pages, resulting in loss of followers for some. The result is that lots of content gets filtered out, but no more so from the right than from the left. What I've heard here today on this panel and for the last panel are anecdotal evidence, so if that's what you want, here's some more. When victims of racist, homophobic, and sexist tweets and comments post those comments to call out the aggressors, it's often the victims that get banned or suspended. Activists associated with Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement have reported just as many, if not more, takedowns of images discussing racism and police, police brutality than any of the anecdotal evidence of suspensions or takedowns on the right. Facebook has a long history of taking down photos of breastfeeding mothers. In 2014, the company suspended drag performers for using their drag names. An advertisement for a book featuring an LGBT vision of Jesus was also rejected. At a minimum, these kind of things happen, but they happen on the left and they happen on the right. If speakers, conservatives, or progressive would like to get blocked less, they should perhaps stop posting lies, defamatory statements, unfounded conspiracy theories, fake news, and so forth. James Woods doesn't have a right to a Twitter megaphone. Neither do racists, homophobes, bigots, misogynists, revenge pornographers, child molesters, sex traffickers, or any number of others. 
So I would ask some people who have, have, the, have had this experience, is it really the case that the platform is discriminating against you because of your views or because of your behavior, which violate platform rules? So why do platforms do this? Well, content moderation occurs algorithmically, is subject to problems. Why do these mistakes happen? Why do people get blocked when they think they shouldn't? Sometimes there are mistakes. Yes, absolutely. Sometimes algorithms make mistakes as well as people make mistakes. Content moderation on Facebook, however, is part of a larger narrative about how even the lack of even reasonable regulation allows Facebook to take a cavalier approach to our privacy, safety, and civic discourse. But if you want to talk about bias, let's talk about the real bias online. Statistically sound, social science research from scholars like Sophia Noble and Latanya Sweeney and researchers at the MIT Media Lab have shown that Google and other platforms are biased. But it's not partisan bias, it's pervasive racial and gender bias. The kind of bias that leads to Google's autocomplete auto searches for why are black girls, for example, with the completed phrase so angry or so loud, or the kind of bias that returns pictures of black women when you search for the word gorilla. In her book, Algorithms of Profession, Oppression, Professor Noble culls many of these examples and shows with pinpoint accuracy and statistical significance that this happens often and far more often than anecdotal evidence of this or that person using, losing followers, and many of those followers were prob probably bots anyway. This bias happens because Google isn't simply a machine. It's software, it's made by humans and enforced by humans, and its software sometimes can't even tell the difference between, say, an Asian woman's eyes and eyes that are closed. We know so little about how this works, and we do need to talk about bias, but not the kind of bias that this panel and this committee appears to be worried about. We need answers to real bias, and those answers may either be readily available through an empowered Federal Trade Commission or access to platform data and research so academics can investigate how a platform like Google biases and harms marginalized populations. Thank you, Professor Waldman. The chair now recognizes Ms. Dillon for your testimony. Ms. Dillon, and I would point out to the panel and the members of the committee that we're expecting votes any minute, so it looks like we can actually conclude this hearing in an appropriate time today, and I hope we're able to do that. Ms. Dillon? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee and their staff. I'm a trial lawyer in private practice in California with a focus Turn on, on your business, microphone, please. With a focus on business. With a focus on business, technology, employment, and First Amendment litigation. In my 25 year career, I've represented numerous clients subject to discrimination in academia, the workplace, consumer markets, and civil rights matters. As a Silicon Valley employment lawyer, I have learned that big tech firms systematically and illegally engage in widespread discrimination against American workers on the basis of their gender, race, religion, values, and political affiliations, the latter of which is barred by California law. Several of these companies employ hiring quotas and preferences to achieve diversity, but not diversity of viewpoint. Google employees who dare to dissent are not only fired, but are also publicly shamed, humiliated, labeled, blacklisted, and sometimes pursued after firing with secretive arbitrations designed to punish and even bankrupt them, all with no right of appeal. My client James Dumore was fired by Google last year because he dared to share Internally within Google, a memorandum he created in response to Google's request for feedback regarding their diversity indoctrination sessions. His memo reflects and discusses widely held views supported by published research regarding differences between men and women, and his thoughts about how those differences might be relevant to making Google's workplace more attractive for women, a goal he viewed as admirable. James fell victim to big tech's war of political correctness and social engineering. And for every James Damore and his colleagues at Google who publicly and privately seek protection against these abusive practices, there are thousands more whose names will never be heard by this committee. Indeed, shortly after I filed the lawsuit on behalf of James Damore and his colleagues, Google moved swiftly for a protective order censoring what information might be publicly disclosed in court filings. And by demanding that James and two of his colleagues submit their claims to separate individual private arbitrations. As a result, most of the employment issues uh, implicated in these cases will never be heard in open court, and both the public and the government may never learn the truth of what occurred or be allowed to consider what actions should be taken to prevent these un-American practices in the future. The employer's motivation across each of these cases appears to be the same, to impose upon their employees only those progressive values that dictate a redistribution of opportunities and benefits to certain defined classes at the expense of others with no regard to the human carnage meted on innocent workers who have not themselves discriminated against anybody. This problem is not restricted to Silicon Valley. 
I have spoken to or represented employees across the United States facing similar issues. I have shared with, my, with the committee my written testimony, two dozen examples of some of the examples of political bias in the workplace I have learned about from the over 100 current and former big tech employees who have contacted my firm within the past year. I have many more examples. To name but one, a Google employee was fired this year as a direct result of his cooperation with a federal investigation into the company's illegal labor practices, including work rules that bar employees from discussing their work conditions one or, one or another, or third parties in violation of the National Labor Relations Act, as well as bullying and retaliation related to protected labor activities. When Google found out that this employee was talking to the government, they printed out two years of his internal search history and interrogated him on search queries related to employee rights issues on multiple instances over the course of several months. Google abruptly suspended and then fired this employee days after the NLRB announced that it was moving forward with his case, after over two years of investigation and policy analysis. The chilling effect of these witch hunts and these decisions cannot be overstated. Big Tech's anti-conservative bias extends far beyond the confines of labor and employment law, and you've heard some examples here today. In some markets, such as digital advertising, big tech companies have near monopoly or duopoly power, such that the lack of competition means consumers are stuck with biased and even discriminatory product offerings. To give but one recent example from the Wall Street Journal, following President Trump's implementation of a travel ban in, in January 2017, Google employees discussed internally how to leverage Google's search functions to counter undesirable political viewpoints while promoting pro-immigration organizations and advocacy. They did all of this without informing consumers that they were manipulating the results of the searches. Google maintains at least nine different blacklists that impact our lives, generally without input or authority from any outside advisory group, industry association, or government agency. The autocomplete blacklist, the Google Maps blacklist, the YouTube blacklist, the Google account blacklist, the Google News blacklist, the Google AdWords blacklist, the Google AdSense blacklist, the search engine blacklist, and the quarantine list. Google advertising sales employees have gone out of their way to inform consumers of sites they should avoid advertising on because the content is quote unquote unsafe, such as Breitbart. Google has banned payday lender ads even though it invests in such companies. Google has taken similar action with respect to bail bondsmen, blocking people from finding legal businesses that are part of our criminal justice system under the guise of banning users from seeing harmful products. Google is not alone. We previously heard here about Twitter censorship. Our client True Pundit, a popular conservative blog which has approximately 270,000 followers on Twitter, has persistently suffered from Twitter's shadow banning, outright banning, and follower deleting practices. Ms. Dillon, could you summarize, please? Yes, sir. Big tech has become an insular fortress of thought coercion and vindictive behavioral control. The culture and tactics of some companies would make Orwell's Big Brother proud, as they often surpass the cult-like thinking described in the book 1984. These actions are broad-based attempts to completely reclassify or dispense with logic and reason and reshape our economy and our society in a progressive utopian form. Thank you for inviting me here, and I look forward to questions. Thank you, Ms. Dillon. I thank all the witnesses for your testimony. Um, now I'll recognize myself for five minutes of questions, and I'd start with Mr. Hoft. And um, I'd ask you, uh, Mr. Hoft, um, have you written about crisis actors? You know, that's a term that we get uh, accused of quite frequently. I actually brought some evidence of that. I expected that this would come up. Um, the Washington Post uh, put out an article. I have a picture here with my picture on it, uh, saying that uh, Gateway Pundit was behind the crisis actors hype. Uh, it's a term we never used. We never use this. Uh, and so this is a, an example of the fake news you see in, not, not uh, online, but in the, in the mainstream media, who repeat this. And uh, it's, a, it's actually a term that was never published on our site. So okay. and, but it was in relation to Parkland shooting. Uh, can, you, is, can you summarize what you wrote about Parkland shooting? We wrote several articles about the Parkland shooting. Of course, it was a big national story. We cover it extensively. And uh, we were one of the first people to point out that, uh, uh, that this, uh, one of the spokesmen for the, the anti-gun groups, his father was in the FBI, and we said that this video, it looked a little strange. It looks like there was somebody coaching him or something. We just pop, you know, put it out there. You can decide for yourself. The feedback we got was about 90% said, yeah, it looked like he's being coached. So uh, it, it, uh, this got us in a lot of trouble with the mainstream media. They reported on this a lot. Hillary uh, or Chelsea Clinton's retweeting it, attacking me. 
but uh, I still stand by that article today. It was, uh, it was a good article, it was good information, and the fact that they're telling us that we can't even question things today is very disturbing. Um, is there a distinction between being coached and being an actor? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this statement. I'm not going to ask you that. I'm going to guess that there's a witness over in the Senate today that is very, very well coached for the testimony that's being delivered as we have this hearing here today. Um, I'm going to argue that that's, a, that's an equivalent situation or perhaps even much more so coaching taking place today. Uh, we know that I, people I think get the coached. President coached Judge Kavanaugh after his disastrous uh, performance. I, I, I can tell the, throw right. the time, Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Raskin, that I'll recognize you in your time. And uh, then uh, um, you have given uh, Mr. Mr. Hoff some, some significant data here, some dramatic reductions. Uh, one of them was uh, 90 plus percent, 93 percent in the aggregate of these were Facebook posts altogether? These, these were uh, top conservative sites. We looked at, we, we, uh, there's tracking websites like SimilarWeb, like uh, 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 there's a few out there. We use their data, we paid for some data, and we saw that with the conservatives, they were getting uh, completely pummeled since the election. A couple of the top conservative sites have been put out of business. Uh, we looked at liberal sites, and like I said, the Western Journal s study found that uh, with liberal sites, their traffic numbers actually went up by 2%. So that's are, the data we Are you today. aware of any members of Congress that are having their communications suppressed? Uh, you know, the Western Journal, again, did a, a, a subsequent study. They found that, uh, again, uh, that conservatives were, were, were facing more of the backlash. Their, their articles were being hidden by Facebook compared to liberal uh, uh, politicians. And uh, so if um, members of Congress wanted to be familiar with the effect of that and familiar with it, is there an outlet that they could access to learn those things? Uh, certainly we put up those, those studies. Uh, I've, I've uh, brought some extra information today that will be put in the congressional record. Uh, like I said, Western Journal did some tremendous uh, reporting on this. Uh, so the information is getting out there, but people don't understand how widespread this is. So thank you for inviting me today to, to testify. But we can't necessarily expect that if you post that information on Facebook that we can find it there. We should go to the <laughs> website instead. Right. You probably better go to the source. Uh, I, I thank you, Mr. Hoffman. I turn to Ms. Cohen, and I appreciate you coming down for your testimony today. And I know you didn't get to the conclusion of your testimony, um, but you had a lot of data that was stark uh, to me to hear from multiple people that are your communications and friends and some people I know mm -hmm. uh, that can't access uh, your material. That's and right. uh, going from uh, tens of thousands uh, from the Boston Herald down to a mere handful on exactly. Twitter. Would you please uh, speak to that? I exactly. And I just highlighted three examples, but I'm a prolific writer. I've published hundreds of columns um, and done hundreds of uh, radio interviews with members of Congress. I've interviewed uh, Attorney General S Jeff Sessions, you name it. I mean, I, I'm very hardworking. I publish at least two to three times a week. So I'm just limiting uh, three examples, but I'm happy to provide the committee with troves of examples how Twitter and Facebook are censoring me. And, and I only uh, gave you a small snippet of my Twitter followers who've told me exactly that they can't see my columns and their feeds. These are people who are following me for a reason. They want to read my content and, they, and see it, and they can't. And um, they're on Twitter all the time, so it's not like they missed it or they, they're only on Twitter once in a while. These are prolific people, my industry peers in television, radio, and in print. And um, if I could just make a comment, I'd like to defend myself and all conservatives from something that Mr. Waldman has said. He's saying that the only reason why social media networks are censoring conservatives is because we, have, we make racist posts and we have hate speech. I have done never any of those things. And number two, I'd like to ask Mr. Walden if he, Waldman if he believes the Declaration of Independence is hate speech because Facebook censored and took down the Declaration of Independence this summer from a community newspaper in Texas. So if that's what you consider hate speech, you don't belong in this country. Well, I miss going, when, rather than start a debate, we're going to recognize that as a rhetorical question. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to uh, conclude um, my part of this questioning and recognize the gentleman from Maryland for his, test for his questioning. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, all of our distinguished witnesses belong in America. Um, but Ms. Cohen, let me start with you. Your story tugs at my heartstrings because I used to read the Boston Herald when I was in college, um, and you were claiming discrimination against you as a conservative, but I'm not even sure what that category means, certainly to the people in this room. 
As a conservative, do you believe in the free market in communication, or do you, or do you believe in government control of private media entities? I think it's a really great question that you brought you up. You've got to answer succinctly, if you would. Okay. I want to say this, that normally uh, conservatives don't support, you know, big government and, and but over regulation. I, that, yeah. But with respect to these social media companies, they're a monopoly effectively because okay, this so is where the majority of Americans get their news, okay, including sorry, voters. So just cutting to the chase here. So yep. you think that Twitter, Facebook, and Google should be regulated by the government? I do, like government. a public utility because I know you wouldn't support right, public bye -bye. utilities cutting off um, their okay, services to certain Thank individuals. You. If, if you get the chair to give me five more minutes, I'll <laughs> pursue it with you. But Mr. Hoff, let me, let me come to you. Now, you were allegedly discriminated against by the uh, Conservative Political Action Committee, which banned you from the conference or disinvited you because of your uh, putative alignment with those saying that the Parkland survivors were crisis actors or were being coached or whatever, for whatever reason, maybe they were wrong in doing it, but did you have a First Amendment claim against them and should you be able to sue them and get an injunction against them for excluding you from the conference? Well, they actually uh, made a decision based on the information they had, and uh, I, I believe that was uh, inaccurate information. Can you sue them? Should you have a First it's Amendment right of action? That's not them? my intention at this point. I was, I was asked not to speak there, and that's fine. That's okay. So let's say you were banned from MSNBC for the same comments that you made or for your comments with InfoWars or whatever. Would you have a right against MSNBC? Uh, if they don't want to have me on, I don't need to go on that channel. And Fox News would have the right to exclude you or me or any liberal Democrat, right? They have the right to choose. So, who they so why do you think that you have a right to make Facebook or Twitter carry you at all? Uh, that's that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, I think with Facebook, we see today people get up in the morning. They're looking at Facebook. It's much larger than one. You can choose the channel you want to watch on television. A lot of people watch. You Fox can't choose. News. You can't choose the channel that you want with Facebook. Okay, there's so no, are you there's no competition. Wait, uh, let me just and get by the way, they also. Uh, Mr. Hoff, I control the time. I'm going to ask you: Are you agreeing with Ms. Cohen that these are public utilities that can be regulated by the government, and we should be regulating them in terms of their content? I think some uh, some some laws need to be passed. I think regulation would be a good thing. I think they need to be transparent too. If they're gonna if they're going to be uh, against conservative thoughts and conservative websites, they need to be honest about that. Okay, so Ms. Dillon, let me come to you um, because y you were actually c complaining about employment, adverse employment action, as I understand it, for people working at I think it was at Google. Who that was among the topics that I discussed. Yeah. So do you believe, as a conservative, that people have a right not to be fired for political reasons by private corporations? Well, as I stated in my testimony, that's actually California law. Yeah. So, so yes, I believe California law should be applied to people who work in California. Okay, and, so you, and you believe that's a general principle, that people should not be able to be fired for their right-wing views, their left-wing views, pro-union, anti-union, what have you. I did not say that. You said that. I'm asking I said you. California I'm asking law. I'm, I'm asking you. No, what is your it, position? I mean, I'm not here to Look, fantasize about laws as that aren't I on said, the books. As I said, excuse me, a lot of my colleagues think you guys are just whining, and I'm trying to torture out of this some theoretical coherence. So what I'm trying to say is what is the legal or what is the legislative remedy you're looking for? Do you think that workers in America should have a right not to be fired for their politics? Is that the position you're taking? I'm not taking a position on federal legislation Okay, here. well, we're I'm not the California the Assembly. Why are you talking to us then? Go take it to the California court. I thought you got something to say to the Congress of the United States. Oh, are you questioning wh why I was invited here? Uh, well, I'm that asking what like you have to say attack. to us. Do, do you have any interest in federal legislation relating to the rights of workers, or you're just telling us about a case that you're dealing with in California? I, I covered a number of topics, but one of them while we're on the subject of federal legislation is Communications Decency Act Section 230 immunity. That is something that a lot of the questions here on this panel seem to ignorantly confuse the fact that Fox News is not covered by the immunity, whereas the social media networks are. I do think that that law needs to be revised to strip that immunity from those companies okay. so you have because no they as, do not deserve me, it. You have no comment as to whether or not workers should have a right not to be fired for their politics. You just don't that think is already the law where I practice law. So okay. that's, that's the law I'm operating under. Mr. Chairman, under. I've had enough. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. And uh, the chair, uh, once again, thanks the witnesses, uh, those on the panel and those on the first panel as well who monitor all of this uh, because I have an intellectual curiosity about where this is going to go, as do I. 
And uh, but this concludes today's hearing. And, and again, I thank all of our witnesses. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. This hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.